I'm here today with Dr. Elaine Freer of Five Paper Buildings, and we're discussing the use of ancillary orders in criminal courts. Um, Elaine, I wondered, um, are there complications that can arise with the content of orders? The main complications that tend to arise with the content of orders is that a number of the orders have got almost infinite possible clauses that can be included. So, for example, a restraining order, the judge can impose any conditions for the protection of the victim that will prevent them from uh, being harassed or intimidated, uh, and a sexual harm prevention order would be an even wider example where uh, the judge can impose any clauses to protect potential victims from sexual harm as a result of the conduct of the offender. And sexual harm prevention orders are used in a really wide variety of cases, everything from people who have been downloading images of child pornography through to people who are convicted of rape. Um, so there's a huge variety of clauses that are appropriate in a uh, sexual harm prevention order. It's important to make sure that your client isn't subjected to clauses that are disproportionate with the aim of the order uh, of, of protecting uh, public. So, for example, if you'd got a client who was a web designer, it would be disproportionate to have a clause that prevented them from connecting to the internet or very strictly uh, prescribe the circumstances in which they could connect to the internet. So you would need to be alive to those sorts of details. Uh, as someone who's defending, you need to take what you know about your client and then through the lens of that look at the clauses that the prosecution has proposed and see whether they are workable. Another example would be if you've got somebody who's got young family or young grandchildren, a clause preventing them having any contact with children. In, for example, an indecent images case would be likely to be disproportionate. And a more appropriate clause might be no unsupervised contact with children or no unsupervised contact with children unless the parents are aware of the conviction. So a lot of the time it's about not just is the clause appropriate at all, but can it be drafted in such a way that it balances the protection mm. with uh, restraining the activities of the offender, um, but not to such an extent that they can't have some semblance of normal life. Yeah. Okay. And in other conversations with you, um, I've, I've understood that there's um, information in your new book about all the different orders. Is in terms of balancing what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and the kind of different tensions in it, your book provides signposting to how to weigh those up? Yes, yeah, so for sexual harm prevention orders, I have used a number of subheadings to signpost the different types of clauses that people are likely to be faced with. So for example, contact, use of the internet, use of cloud storage mm -hmm. facilities, uh, trying to break down into subcategories, the most common clauses that somebody might find and just give them some thoughts as to how they can uh, either ensure the clause is drafted appropriately for their client or even argue that that particular clause shouldn't be included in the order. Right, okay. That's really helpful to understand. Thank you.